Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. All right, everybody, grab your faces quick because you may want to pull some of that skin away. You may want to do some things that you do in the mirror when no one's around. Well, we have someone that's going to talk about that, Dr. Jorge Perez, who is an MD plastic surgeon. You know those plastic surgeons that can make you look 50 years younger? No, they can't. But I have Dr. Perez here that's going to kind of tell us what the real scoop is. And and before he's on, I have to tell you, I have to share something. He just showed me a picture on his iPhone of his grandmother, who was 106, and she looks fantastic, and, and he has such great stories. So, you know, it's good for you as a plastic surgeon to appreciate that older woman because everybody doesn't come in at 50, do they? Oh, no. Our, our practice uh, is everything from teenagers on up. Okay, so plastic surgery. Why did you want to do this? When you went to medical school, did you have other choices? What, what put you into that? Well, actually, Anita, when I uh, first went to medical school, I had intended to be a surgeon. And um, I uh, started in a uh, general surgery residency. I did four years of general surgery, and I, I actually enjoyed doing general surgery. It was a lot of fun. And then I did a plastic surgery rotation uh, within my general surgery period, and it turned out that it was just uh, an incredible uh, experience for me. It was very different from any other type of surgery. Uh, it's totally um, unique and creative. Each and every patient is individualized. No two surgeries are exactly the same. There's no such thing as cookie-cutter surgery. And uh, I, I did my rotation and decided to become a plastic surgeon and have never looked back. And are you an artist? Let's say, forget the plastic surgeon right now. Did you like to paint or did you like to sculpt? Well, it's interesting. I'm often asked by patients um, the morning of surgery if I feel artistic. And my answer to them is there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, the good news is that, yes, I do feel artistic. The bad news is that I'm feeling like Picasso. <laughs> Look the, out, right? The truth is that, uh, as Rita Rudner would say, uh, my nose, it may not be perfect, but at least it's centered. Um, be careful what you wish for. But I, I, uh, I actually am not uh, really adept at, at painting or sculpting in that sense. Um, probably the most creative thing I do is cook. I enjoy cooking. And, uh, and there's actually, there are many similarities between cooking and, and surgery and even plastic surgery. Uh, but I think probably the single most significant factor in my personal life that contributes to my plastic surgery career is the fact that uh, when I was in college, my major was mathematics. And I think the most important thing about plastic surgery is understanding spatial relationships and how things kind of come together. And if you impact something on one side, how will it impact on the other side? Uh, and I think mathematics really has uh, helped shape me as a plastic surgeon. Well, that's, I haven't heard that one before, but that's a very good answer. Well, let's just talk a little bit. of Now, I know you're young, but you're not that young that you knew what they used to do when they first plastic surgery was really for the stars in Hollywood. It wasn't everybody didn't do this casually. And then uh, then things changed. What really changed all this? Was it your methods or what is it when you're as a plastic surgeon? Well, I think that when plastic surgery was first introduced uh, to uh, the mainstream back in the 60s and 70s, uh, it really was for celebrities and, and the wealthy. Um, obviously, it's an expense that's out of pocket, and people generally uh, don't think of medical treatments as, an, as a, a personal expense. Um, but I think that as it became uh, more mainstream, and I think that as it became more affordable, uh, there are more plastic surgeons, uh, there are more available treatments, there are more uh, device manufacturers out there manufacturing things. And, uh, and so between that and, and I think a greater public awareness uh, we've seen a number of reality TV shows related to plastic surgery. Uh, celebrities and people are a lot more forthcoming in telling their stories. And so I think it has really become so mainstream that it is absolutely within the reach of the average person. And, you know, my typical patient is not a famous celebrity or a wealthy patient. Uh, obviously, I have a subset of those as well. But uh, my mainstream patient is really a working class person who saves their money and decides that this year, instead of taking a, a vacation somewhere, they're going to enjoy a facelift or, uh, or breast surgery or body contouring surgery. And, and that's pretty much, uh, uh, I think, where, where plastic surgery has evolved to. So, Dr. Perez, you told me a, an enchanting um, story, in a sense, about the 20-year-old and the 40-year-old. I love that. I've never heard that before. You must repeat that to our audience. Well, it's interesting. I, I, um, I, I have the privilege of speaking to many audiences, and um, 
I'm, I'm always asked, uh, when does vanity end? And um, I, I tell the story, which is a true story. I'll typically see a 20-year-old who will say to me, uh, you do plastic surgery on 40-year-olds? Why would a 40-year-old want to have plastic surgery? Um, and then I'll see the 40-year-old who says, you mean you do, do plastic surgery on 60-year-olds? Um, the 60-year-old will say, you actually do plastic surgery on 80-year-olds? And the answer is that they'll find out when they get there why we do plastic surgery on that age group because it's always in the distance. Uh, but when we get there, it's, it's very real. Um, and uh, the, the answer is that vanity never ends. And that's why, I, I, as I showed you my, the picture of my 105-year-old grandmother, uh, who is uh, very, very vigorous and very active, and uh, she is still a flirt at age 100 um, and will not leave the house without her makeup or her hair uh, perfectly done. In fact, the last time I saw my grandmother upset, uh, she, and she was visibly upset, and I said, Grandma, what's going on? She was upset because she wasn't happy with her hairdo. <laughs> and, uh, and so vanity never ends. Uh, there's always an element of that in, in all of us, and, and that's a good thing, I think, because we all care about ourselves and we care about our self-image. Tell me about the male versus female in your practice. Uh, overall, men represent probably about 10 to 20% of plastic surgery patients. Uh, they, uh, there are certain procedures that are more common in men. Men, for example, will do their eyelids very commonly. That's probably the most uh, common procedure that we do for men. That's where they first notice that they're starting to show signs of aging. Uh, the other place is uh, under the neck, the turkey gobbler. Men will grab the waddle and shake it and say, Doc, can you do anything about this? And the third area is the liposuction of the love handles, the belly. Uh, so those are the three most common procedures we do for men. There's also a subset for younger men who have uh, breast enlargement, uh, and they'll have uh, procedures for what's called gynecomastia. Those are the most common things we do for men. Men uh, approach it with the same vigor and, and interest as women do. They tend to be a little bit more discreet about it. They don't talk about it as much as women do, but they absolutely have the same level of interest. All right, so let's take the female who's, let's say, has this done, she's 50, 50, maybe 60. Will it last for the rest of her life? Well, it depends on the procedure, of course. Um, certain procedures are intended to be lifelong procedures. For example, uh, rhinoplasty, nose reshaping, is a procedure that typically is done once in a lifetime, assuming that it's done to the satisfaction of the patient. One of the problems is that very often the patients go back to try to get it a little bit better, a little bit better, and then sometimes it can be worse. I call that the Michael Jackson syndrome. As, as you know, um, he had multiple procedures done, always trying to make things a little better and ultimately ended up making things a lot worse with respect to his nose. But um, otherwise, if the procedure is done satisfactorily, it is a one-time procedure. Other procedures that are uh, intended to be aging-type procedures, for example, the facelift uh, or the eyelid surgery, uh, are not lifelong procedures in the sense that, obviously, the day after surgery, the patient continues to age. And how quickly they age depends largely on their body's genetics. So we have the younger patients who may look older, and older patients who look younger, so they're going to age at their appropriate pace. Um, however, when I'm asked that question, what I do is I, I kind of turn the question around to the patient and answer it in a slightly different way. Um, when I see patients who've had facelifts, typically they come in for a secondary facelift, usually about 10 to 15 years after the first. doesn't mean that that's when they first notice they're aging. It just means that that's about when the time that they're ready to invest in the surgery and the, and the expense and so forth to have it done again. Uh, for eyelid surgery, it can actually, if it's well done, patients can enjoy it for 15, 20 years and not, not need to redo it. So these procedures can really be um, uh, not necessarily lifelong, but they can last for, for quite a long period of time, certainly longer than a vacation to Europe or the Caribbean. Um, and, uh, and it's something they enjoy each and every day, every time they look in the mirror. And I was thinking about that as you were, as you were talking, because years ago, we remember that people disappeared for two weeks. They were on a vacation, whatever they said. They didn't want anyone to know they had it done, but now it is different. They they go out with their glasses on. They'll show you. In fact, I have to talk about breasts. I'm sure. Do you do breast reduction? Do you do sure. any of that? Sure. We were at our neighbor's house, and he was single, and he had some beautiful women over there, and nothing would do. But um, the woman, one woman said, "Oh, I just had breast surgery," and she opens her blouse and shows her breasts, and it was like, you know, we were all floored. But I think. I guess there's something about that, that they're not really hers, but they are hers. And I mean, people have just, what is that? Yeah. Well, uh, breast surgery in particular for women uh, does uh, link to um, their self-confidence. And 
the the most amazing transformations that I see in my practice are often women who are otherwise in great shape, but feel that uh, their breasts obviously are disproportionately small or large. And if they have that, just that one thing corrected, it really changes their whole personality and their whole self-image. It really, we, we've, we see patients who are kind of a little bit of wallflowers when they come in, they're quiet and they're shy. And when they come in after surgery, they, they do exactly what you just suggested. They want to pull up their, their blouse right in the waiting room. Um, <laughs> and, and you're absolutely right that it used to be that people would hide and be secretive about having plastic surgery. Uh, that's not really the case anymore. Although we do have snowbirds and folks who come down and they use this as a vacation excuse and then go back looking very refreshed uh, if they don't want to tell their, their uh, friends and family. But otherwise, people are usually very uh, forthcoming about it. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. Um, I happen to have a lot of realtors in my practice because realtors always feel that they're in the public eye and they want to be very competitive and they always want to look youthful and vigorous. And uh, so I ha- happened to do a facelift on a, on a realtor and uh, she had a closing two days after the facelift. And so she had a little bit of bruising and swelling. Typically, our patients don't swell and bruise that much. Uh, she had a little bit, uh, but you could tell that it was something unusual. And so she walked into the closing, and the other realtor kind of looked at her, and um, she just dismissed her and waved her hand and said, oh, had a facelift, had a facelift, had a facelift. And turns out that the, <laughs> turns out the other realtor was my patient also and had had breast, breast surgery. So they ended up talking about plastic surgery more than the closing, more than the property that day. That's beautiful. It sounds like you are quite an interesting um, uh, conversationalist and a physician. I'm sure when you go to parties and they find out you're um, you're a plastic surgeon, all the questions they want to know about this, because I have a gynecologist that laughs too, because a lot of women, when they find out he's a gynecologist, they have a lot of questions too about everything that's going on now. But Dr. Jorge Perez, uh, MD, plastic surgeon, and I want to give you a way that you can contact him. You can actually go on his website, uh, and remember, this is Pencil Talk Radio, so you do want to get your pencils out. Write this down. It's PerezPlasticSurgery.com. That's easy. PerezPlasticSurgery.com. And I'll give you a phone number. If you'd like to call for a consultation, I'm sure he'd be glad to see you. The phone number is 954-351-2200. That's 954-351-2200. His, uh, his office is located in Fort Lauderdale and... When, you know, when we see people, and I just have to say this, I've seen now movie stars who really don't look like the same person. I mean, they've had plastic surgery. Now, you'd think they'd go to a very good plastic surgeon. What, what is that? I mean, do they want not to look like they used to and just have some of the, the um, extra fat taken away? But why do they look different? Well, that's a good question, Anita, because celebrities in general are a different animal. They're a different breed. Uh, first of all, the assumption that they are well-informed and are making the best choices is not necessarily correct. Very often, they will have a referral to a particular surgeon who may not even be board certified or may not have the proper credentials. Um, it just happens to be that it has a connection from through a friend and so forth. Um, they they may not necessarily do their homework, which is what some what what every potential plastic surgery patient really should do in terms of checking, vetting the credentials uh, and the experience of the surgeon. But uh, in addition to that, there's an odd kind of um, element that goes on in uh, Los Angeles in the celebrity culture, and that is that uh, the celebrities and, and their plastic surgeons often think that they are on the cutting edge, and therefore they need to push the envelope right to the limit. And so they tend to do things that are a little bit over the top. They'll, instead of doing a simple facelift to make the patient look refreshed and natural and look like themselves, they'll put in fat grafts and cheek implants and chin implants and, pound, and, and fill up the face or pump the lips up and, 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 or do brow lifting and do all kinds of procedures that really change the entire personality and complexion of the face. And uh, all in an effort to be kind of the cutting edge. And I think um, it's not only not cutting edge and not aesthetically attractive, but it, it can detract from the uh, person's original uh, beauty. I mean, we've seen that in many celebrities. Uh, for example, um, you know, sadly, before she died, there were many pictures of Farrah Fawcett, who was the pinup girl of the 70s, an absolutely stunningly beautiful woman. And in, later in her life, you could tell she had had many procedures that really almost distorted her face. And I think that's a phenomenon that happens in the celebrity culture uh, that it happens sometimes even in our culture here in South Florida that I think is counterproductive. I mean, I think the goal 
of, a, of an aesthetic facelift, aesthetic facial rejuvenation should really be to take what the patient has and just enhance it, refresh it, make it look natural, revise it to a point where they look like themselves, but just a little bit better. I love to hear you say that because I have a friend. I mean, she's not a close friend, but um, I saw her recently and I knew immediately she had a facelift, not because she was refreshed, but because she looked different. And, and I didn't think that should happen. And that's why I'm very glad you answered it that way. So you would look at someone, you say, okay, well, we're just going to bring you back a certain amount of years, but you're going to look the same, except you're not going to have all, maybe some of the wrinkles and the things you have. That's yeah. what you're saying, I tell I guess. the patients that the, the ultimate compliment is not when your friends and family walk up to you and say, oh, you had a facelift. That's not a compliment. The compliment is, did you change your hair or there's you something so different good, about you? Right? You, you, yeah. you went to the Caribbean. You, that was a great, you must have found the fountain of youth there. You, there's something right. fresher, different about you. They just can't quite put their finger on it. It puzzles them. It bothers them. Um, but they don't know that you had a facelift. That's the ultimate compliment. Yeah, that is. And I agree. And I'm so glad that you're, uh, you know, you're saying all these things because I'm sure that you have seen people and you probably have people who've come to you. They're looking for a second opinion and they want you to you know, tell them that what else you can do for them. And then there are people like that that go from plastic surgeon to plastic surgeon and they have a little done and a more done. I mean, I think that's a psychological problem, isn't it? It can be. It can be. And uh, unfortunately, um, I'm sad to say that there are members of, of my profession that will feed into that and uh, and don't don't turn those folks away when they need to, when they need to be turned away. Um, they should and, be, and stop they? And stop the, the pattern of repeated surgery. Uh, and which I do very often. I'll 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 see a patient, um, and sadly they may have been to three or four other surgeons who are ready to do surgery, and I'll tell them to put their money away, put their their uh, uh, their um, uh, life, uh, you know, back on a different path, and forget about having additional plastic surgery because it's really not what they need. I was going to just say, do you have when you first meet someone and you're they're talking about it? Do you have a psychological? A test or something to see what do they really want and why do they want it and make sure that it's for what you're saying and not for other reasons we don't have a psychological test I don't think that's necessary for most people I you think know most people are appropriate <laughs> um, they come in and they have a, a problem and and generally it's it's a problem that most others would identify and say yeah I think that would enhance your appearance so most of our patients I will say are appropriate um, there is a subset uh, of patients that are, I think, uh, uh, perhaps on that edge where they uh, really are looking for something that is not appropriate. And there are sometimes there are red flags that we do look for. Uh, for example, a, a particular difficult, particularly difficult time in their lives, maybe a divorce or a death, and that's the motiv motivating factor, which it really, sh which it should not be. So if I sense any of those red flags, then very often I will either back off or, or tell the patient, you know what, I don't think this is the proper time for you to be making this kind of decision. Um, but for the most part, I think, at least in my practice, our patients are um, are appropriate. Their their wishes are appropriate, and uh, and they they allow us to kind of guide them into what the correct thing to do is and what the right path is. And uh, Dr. Perez, you did say that, of course, your grandmother was 105, and your mother, I suppose, is in her must be in her 80s or 70s. Yes, she is. Okay, and uh, so that's that's very interesting that you have those kind of role models. Um, what is the oldest person that you've ever done a facelift on? And what did you do? The oldest patient I did a facelift on was 89. Um, but she was 89 going on 59 because she played golf almost every day. Uh, had a, a boyfriend who was in his 60s. Oh, a cougar, yes. Who, a cougar, right. a real cougar. Oh, I love it. And, uh, and, she, and he was oblivious to her real age. She never told him and he... And, he didn't oh, know it. this is terrific. And you would never guess it because I, I actually had, had been doing, I, I did her third facelift. Uh, I was not involved in the first two. I was doing her third facelift at 89. Um, but she was a youthful woman. Her, she looked young, very attractive, had a youthful spirit and had a high energy level and um, and just enjoyed her facelift like any other uh, any other young young woman would. That's lovely. There's also an, another interesting subset I need of patients uh, here in South Florida I don't know if you're aware, but there is a ballroom dancing mafia, I call it. Uh, these okay. are women in their 70s and 80s who are in amazing shape, have the body of a 20-year-old. If you look at them from behind, you think you're looking at a 20-year-old woman, and it's only if they turn around that you see that their faces are more consistent with their age, but they are in amazing shape. They have amazing youthful spirits, 
And I have a large group of those that I have in my practice, the ballroom dancing women in South Florida, and they love to dance and they, they love to look good. The, ba- the ballroom mafia, that's a term I never heard before. But now what happens to some women who've had too much sun and, and you know, their, their face is just so cracked or whatever you want to say. Can you do, what do you use um, to, to help them? Well, there are certain things that uh, are limitations. And sometimes I've said to patients, my, my name is Perez, it's not Copperfield. There are, I'm, I'm not a magician. There are only certain things that we can accomplish. Uh, obviously, the individual first has their genetics to deal with. That's the hand that we're all dealt. And some, some women have better genetics than others. They're lucky. They inherited uh, good genes from their parents. They chose their parents wisely, as I say. And uh, that's the key, by the way, to graceful aging is choosing your parents wisely. It's also the key to being wealthy. Next, next time around, come back as a Rockefeller or a Kennedy. Right. Uh, but, um, uh, but beyond that, those obviously are not within our control. But there are certain variables that are within our control, and two in particular that are, that are real uh, thorns in my side, and I, I am very uh, proactive about, about discussing this with, pa- with patients. One is smoking, and the other is sun exposure. Because both of those not only will do harm to the, to the organism as a whole, to the body as a whole, but it also does a lot of harm to the skin. And it's a very interesting phenomenon. When I see women who smoke, obviously they know by now that smoking causes cancer and lung disease and all kinds of horrific things. But when I tell them that they're going to wrinkle and age prematurely, that all of a sudden it. they a stop. Sudden, cold turkey, and I tell right? them you have to stop for your facelift. And I have had a significant number of women who have stopped smoking. I, I will do a facelift on smokers. Some surgeons will not. I will do it. However, I have to have the commitment from the patient that they'll stop. And many of those patients stop after the surgery and never go back to it. And I tell them that that, that has done more for their well-being than the, the surgery itself. But this is actually a very, uh, an excellent uh, kind of secondary consequence of the, the surgery. That is just great. Uh, that's wonderful. I've never smoked and I, I know that it's hard for people to stop, but it really, every doctor I've ever interviewed, no whether they're a gastroenterologist or a brain surgeon, they all talk about the smoking. I mean, the smoking... Every specialty is, just, is impacted by smoking, including plastic surgery. Oh, I would, I would dare say so. Um, but let's, uh, let's just talk a little bit. Have you always lived in South Florida? No, I, I uh, grew up in New York, New York City, and that's where I went to medical school. I went to uh, Albert Einstein in New York City, and that's where I did um, medical school, general surgery residency, plastic surgery residency. I even stayed as a member of the faculty for a year there. So I was almost a dozen years um, at uh, Albert Einstein in New York, and it was a phenomenal place to train. I, I love the training. It was an amazing um, place. The, the uh, faculty, the research facilities, the wealth of, of pathology and, and individual um, opportunities to learn in the, in the Bronx in New York were excellent. Uh, however, it was a lousy place to live. And I got on the first rocket ship out of there as soon as I finished um, that period of, of my life. And I've been here in South Florida in private practice in Fort Lauderdale for the past uh, 25 years. 25 years. Looks like you graduated at a very early age. You knew that you, uh, did you know you wanted to be a doctor when you were very young? Are anyone in your family a physician? I have several physicians in my family, and um, I was shaped largely by my mother. She, um, she was, always wanted to have a son who's a doctor like many mothers do. And uh, she kind of pushed me in that direction, but I always had an, uh, an affinity for math and science, and yeah, um, right. and I um, I enjoyed it, and and I, I love being a doctor. It's it's I, I love being a plastic surgeon. It's the most fun that I have. I love what I do. I I enjoy each and every operation that I do. Um, after I do an operation, I'm reliving it and enjoying it the next day and the day after because it's it's really an experience to go through, and and it, it has such a great impact on patients. Just this past week, I had two patients who who were in my office crying after after the surgery um, because they, they couldn't believe how, how good they looked and how this problem that had vexed them for so many years had finally been corrected. And coincidentally, two of them just this past week, it, it's, it's a very rewarding profession because we truly have a huge opportunity to make an impact on people's lives. And plastic surgery, as much as sometimes it gets kind of dismissed as, as a frilly specialty, uh, it, it really is not. It really has a huge impact on, on people. I think you've made that very clear today. I think that's really excellent. And it shouldn't be something that someone's embarrassed about. It's, you see, when you have other kinds of surgeries, even breast, it's all underneath and clothes. You know, you don't get to see it, but on your face or on your body. Well, let's go back and talk about people as they're aging and their hands and their hands start to get 
and I've seen this when I, I live near Palm Beach, and here you see these beautiful women with faces, and then you look at their hands, and you know what age they are. And so what do you do about that? Can you? Well, hands are, are uh, one part of the body that I actually uh, don't treat, um, or very rarely, uh, because most of those treatments are non-surgical in the sense that uh, the, some of the procedures that we've talked about, facelifts and breast surgery, are true surgical procedures. The treatments for the aging hand are typically more of the uh, topical treatments, things like injectables. There are some fillers that can be put in to make the hand look a little plumper, or a little bit more youthful, uh, or some um, superficial laser treatments or peel treatments to make some of the, um, the uh, brown spots or the, the blemishes less noticeable. Um, my practice is dedicated to surgical plastic surgery. I do facelifts and eyelids and breasts and, and uh, body contouring. Uh, but the the non-surgical or the less invasive things like lasers and fillers and peels and things like that, I, I defer to some of the excellent dermatologists that we have in South Florida. So in other words, if someone comes in and you take, you look at them as a person that wants to look better, you would then say, well, I'll do this, but then you need to have this done and you should go here or do something else. Very often, uh, I do have a kind of a team approach to things. And um, it's kind of like I, I tell patients, uh, we need to create the cake and then we can frost it afterwards. <laughs> and so very often, for example, a woman who has laxity of the cheek or the jowl or the neck is a good candidate to have a surgical facelift. And uh, then what I tell them is after we do that and after you recover from that, then there are a number of tools available to do the fine tuning, some of the, the polishing, for example, of the wrinkles or taking care of some of the blemishes, or injecting maybe a little filler in a particular wrinkle that bothers the patient. Usually, uh, the patients want either n none of that or very little of that, because very often they're just satisfied with the surgery. But if they do, it's a nice compliment, it's a nice supplement to, to do, and uh, there are many excellent dermatologists that we work with that um, can offer that to the patient afterwards. The mistake I think sometimes patients make is that they'll often do that type of treatment, the laser or the injectable, First and not oh. take care of the, correct, first, and not take care of the, the lax right. skin. And and that kind of looks a little bit peculiar. Well, Dr. Perez, we are going to have you on more. This was the most fascinating. I loved it. it I've had other plastic surgeons on before, but there's something uh, really mesmerizing by you, and I'm sure people will feel that. The phone number to call, 954-351-2200. Go to his website, Perez, P-E-R-E-Z, PlasticSurgery.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anita. It's been a pleasure.